Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my job today to welcome you very warmly to the um, Auckland Art Gallery Toyo Tamaki. I am um, Sophie Matheson, Senior Curator of International Art here at the gallery, and um, I'm here with um, my wonderful, our wonderful team, um, Ellie Lim, uh, organiser of today's event, um, and some other colleagues in the back room with the paintings themselves, so thank you very much. And um, I would just like to say how fantastic it is to have um, met Lovejit, um, who um, was uh, first um, in touch with us in September 2022. And um, he um, identified himself as uh, a local scholar of Sikh culture, and it became apparent to us that we had badly misunderstood a group of Indian paintings in the collection. And thanks to his um, iconographical knowledge and persistence, and his knowledge of Gamoki, he was able to shed a huge amount of light on those pictures and today's uh, the unveiling of that research. So thank you very, very much. And um, it was also very, very rejuvenating for us to um, have a fresh angle on our own collection because it starts up new conversations around the world, not just here, and also possibilities for what we might do in the future. I've already met a number of dignitaries here who are in the room, thanks to uh, Lovejit's uh, great pulling power and uh, the <laughs> respect he um, commands in the community as a rising star, I would say. Um, and um, also perhaps to do with the, um, the radio interview on Radio Spice uh, earlier this week with the business leader, Anavtesh Shingwandwa Hara. Um, so thank you for rounding up the troops. Um, and um, I um, would also like to point out uh, Lovejit's terrific Instagram post, Snippets of Punjab, which I think has 5,700 uh, followers. Uh, so that's quite something. Um, so, um, yes, uh, thank you again, I loved it, and welcome to everybody. I hope you enjoy the morning, and after the talk, there'll be an opportunity to see the paintings, but also to mingle and have some refreshments um, with our um, great thanks and blessings, and, um, and uh, I hope that this leads to something again in the future, maybe this time next year. Thank you. Uh, Sasri Kal, hello and kia ora to everybody here. I'd like to thank you for thank you all for coming. Um, this being kind of a first of its kind, I'd like to say we're making history here, hopefully carving a path for many generations to come. Just before I start with the presentation, I'd like to thank Paul Goldsmith, the cultural minister, for popping by today as well, and if you'd like to say a couple words. Uh, Sasha Carl, and um, I just wanted to uh, say uh, uh, my uh, congratulations to Lovejit and uh, the team here at uh, the Art Gallery uh, for what, what is, uh, I think, quite a, uh, um, a wonderful little uh, piece of uh, little history here in New Zealand. Uh, this, this gallery, uh, like um, Te Papa and many um, uh, collections across New Zealand have uh, pieces uh, that we don't necessarily know where they came from and how they turned up and what they are. Uh, and of course, one of the um, uh, amazing things about uh, New Zealand's history over the past few decades is that we've had uh, people from all over the world come and settle here uh, of many different cultures. And uh, I think it's a, just a, a, a wonderful story of, of Lovejit uh, exploring well, what have we got here at Auckland uh, um, Gallery, um, and through uh, his understanding of the, of the language, identifying uh, these uh, Sikh works uh, that we have in the collection and, and getting them um, correctly named. So uh, I just thought I, uh, th this is actually my first official function uh, in any <laughs> respect as Minister of Arts and Culture in the new government. We've been sworn in for five days, uh, and <laughs> we've been down in Wellington uh, charging about. Uh, all over the place, and so uh, my good friend Nav Navtev uh, uh, roped me along to come along, and so I'm very fascinated to hear uh, what um, uh, Lovejit has to say, and uh, really just to acknowledge uh, what I think is um, a, a nice story. So thank you very much for the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. <laughs> so often Sikh art is normally an untouched topic, Right, so I thought the best way to start off today would be exploring Sikh art and what it actually is. So Sikh art 
cannot be defined or cornered into a box. There's different types of art. There's frescoes, murals, oil paintings, or most famously, the bar paintings, which instead of setting a scene, it would have multiple different key figures placed into one central area. And often, as we know, Sikhs faced a turbulent time during its early period. And that's why a lot of the art that we actually get to see is from, you could say, the late 18th to mid 19th century. So that's when the Sikhs began to gain some prominence and actually were able to live normal lives after numerous Afghan or Mughal invasions. So to start off, we are lucky that we have art from the era of the gurus. So this painting itself is from 1650, which is six years after the Jyoti Jyot, or passing of the Sikh, sixth Sikh guru, Guru Hargobind Sahib. So a lot of people actually think that we don't have anything from the era, but here's an example. You can see that with the royal attire and the dagger and the hunting gloves, it personifies his concept of midi and piri, which is spiritual and temporal authority, which paved the way for the Sikh emperor that we know today. Along, along with this, you could say that although this is six years after his passing, six years after his passing, you can see that it's actually done by a Mughal school. So they each, each school had their own influences on how they designed their architecture. So if you were to compare this with other contemporary art from 1650s, they'd have similar features with, you could say, the way the gold is used or the design of the clothes. Because this itself portrays a very royal image, which you can see from the Mughal school. After this, you, we would get a lot of Janam Sakis, also known as birth stories. So what the role of Jan Janam Sakis were is they portrayed spiritual, religious uh, messages throughout their art. And each, you could say each painting offered a different story or a different meaning behind it. So with this one, often done by, you could say, Hindu artists in Delhi or Calcutta, they would add their own twist to the paintings, but keeping in line with stories that you would have heard throughout Sikh history. So this specific painting shows Guru Nanak Dev Ji's visit to the Mecca, in which he would debate Islamic scholars, also known as mullahs. And with him, you can see Pai Madana as well. These type of paintings offer offer not only spiritual um, information, they also offer historical. So a lot of the stories we get of what people went through or the tr journeys that Guru Nanak Dev Ji went come from these type of Janam Sakis, which have been sourced from earlier sources. So European influence within the Punjab region began as early as you could say uh, mid to late 18th century. So that was when, after the British had done taking over or battling in the lower half of India, they began to reach the Middle Plains, and from Middle Plains they went further north. And this painting here shows one of the earliest analyses and sketches of what a Sikh looked like. And this one is dated to about 1790s. From this, you can also see the Sikh articles of faith with the kara on the wrist and the kashara he's wearing, but also compare this with how we are now, and you can judge what type of time that they went through compared to the era we're living through now. This would be just after the period of Mughal persecutions and the numerous Afghan invasions throughout the Punjab region, so these were well-drilled warriors living day-to-day -day lives. With, and you can see that with the weapons in the background as well. After this, <clears throat> so not only did art act as a viewpoint into the past, it was also a 
you could say, a treaty between nations. So a lot of, peop a lot of people don't know is that the Sikh Empire had very strong relations with the fr French nation during the, you could say, between 1800 to 1849. And this was because of a lot of French officers working in Maharaja's um, own army. And what would happen is that when the soldiers would want to go to breaks, they would go visit, you could say, so General Allard was an Italian officer, but he was sent to France due to the strong relations. And what he did or was commanded to do was he got this oil painting of Maharaja Ranjit Singh painted in 1838. And this was gifted to the King of France, Louise Philippe the First. And this was just a symbol of, <clears throat> this was to symbolize the friendship between the two countries. And this was actually in the Louvre Museum, which is where the Mona Lisa is held. But this is, I think, in the storage. Um, interestingly, when these type of gifts would occur, in the back you can see a French flag. And this is not only to sim signify the French soldiers in the Maharaja's army, but also that it is a gift to the French nation. After this, we see, so this would be 1854, the period where the Sikh empire had fallen, and now it's in colonial Punjab. This is the golden temple over here, and this is uh, the white building to the left is called Darshan Diori. And this is perhaps one of the earliest paintings we have of that, or you could say the Hermandar Saib complex or Golden Temple complex. What these type of paintings do is give us a view of what architecture or what the surroundings would have been like during, post uh, during early colonial Punjab. And one building uh, that you see in the middle is not there anymore in the complex. And this is actually Maharaja Ranjit Singh's palace. This would be destroyed uh, and, and be replaced by a church as colonial Punjab uh, progressed further and further. But that's perhaps one of the earliest, uh, best paintings we have of what Maharaja's palace looked like inside the Hermandar Saib complex. You can also kind of see how the simplicity of the complex, how you've got uh, forest, trees all around, very different to what we have today. The, another type of Sikh art is fresco work or murals. And what murals did, similar to Janam Sakhi's, they portrayed stories or characters in Gurdwaras. And this is uh, Baba Deep Singh, quite a, quite a common figure. And this painting itself is in the Baba Dalrai Gordwara, which is in the complex of the Golden Temple. And perhaps that's one of the last Gurdwaras or Sikh place of worship that still has these type of paintings on its walls. What these paintings offered was in a time where education wasn't high, people would visually learn stories. So a lot of Gurdwaras or houses would be filled with beautiful paintings, uh, <clears throat> uh, which would tell stories about famous people. Uh, in Punjabi, this is known as Morakashi. Sadly, as the times have progressed and the Sikh thought of what architecture should look like has changed, what happened to these paintings was in order to make the Gurdwaras fancier or nicer looking, they would be plastered over. Uh, which meant that we lost a lot of heritage. It was either they'd be plastered over in white marble or they'd be covered in gold. So you could see the outlines of the paintings, but you would lose what the actual essence of the art was. You can see that he's dressed in all warrior attire with multiple uh, weapons. Perhaps one of the most famous Sikh paintings. Uh, as the Sikhs gained prominence, they were also able to establish and acquire foreign artists. 
to do their paintings. And here is the son of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, uh, Maharaja Shir Singh, seated on his golden throne there and pretty much wearing the whole Tosha Kanna, or um, you, th you could say the collection of the empire. So within it, on his right arm, between the two green stones, you can see the Kohinoor, which now is on, or well, was previously on the queen's uh, crown. So after, so the, the stone was initially part of the Hindu empire, and then once the Mughals took over, passed down to the Mughals, and then to the Afghans, and then eventually when the Sikhs uh, the territories that were owned to the Afghans, Maharaja Ranjit Singh was able to acquire the Gohinu on the shoulder there. Although the Maharaja himself never dressed this fancy, uh, in the occasion of August Goft, that Maharaja Shir Singh wanted to portray all the jewelry that he could have. On the, you can see that big purple, or uh, pink purple necklace. That's also called the Timur Ruby, and that is perhaps one of, if, I think that's in the collection of the king now as well, because a lot of the, pretty much majority of the jewelry, once the Sikh empire fell, everything was taken to England. And a lot of it uh, was sold to the queen, some was sold in 1851 in famous auctions, but a lot of, you could probably see the jewelry here is probably in the collection of the king now. Uh, you could see though, still, although heavily jeweled up, he still has the warrior aspect. He's got a double-edged kanda, or sword, in his right hand, a katar, uh, a shamshir, just below his right hand, and a talwar, or a sword, on his uh, left leg as well. Everyone can have a look, yeah. Uh, with these, uh, not only were jewels displayed, Sikhs would also often uh, embellish their weapons with gold to show a sign of royalty. So you can see that the kanda, double-edged sword, in his hand is heavily detailed with gold. And this would also go into their art. So one of the paintings you'll see inside, the middle one actually has gold foliage on the art itself. As you get towards the end of it, uh, in the n early 19th century, we would see a lot of the art from the Sikh gurus. So this, perhaps one of perhaps uh, one of the nicest paintings I've seen, is a gold foliage equestrian portrait of Guru Gobind Singh Ji, the 10th Sikh guru. And on it, what you would see is, if you compare this image to one of, let's say, a Mughal emperor it would look very similar because they would take the inspiration of royalty and add their own, uh, the gurus onto it. And then whilst also having, you could see the umbrella in all paintings signifies, uh, you could say royalty and spiritual, um, like the spiritual aspect. And in the back end, you can also see a Kali Nihang, uh, the warriors of the Sikhs. Uh, the main warrior contingent of the Sikhs. The dog in the bottom right also signifies the hunting aspect of Sikhi and how they would go on hunts with dogs and everything like that. The figure you see in the top left, normally found in Hindu paintings, but what some people get the misconception is that Paintings were almost like, uh, you could say multiple communities played their role. It wasn't just Sikhs making Sikh paintings. It would be Hindus, or as you saw before, a foreigner from Europe, August Skoeth. So they would add their own impact or influence onto the design. So that's where you get Hindu deities in the top left, because this was done by Ram Chand in the 1830s to 1840s. Perhaps when you look at what the Darbar or royal court of the Sikhs looked like, this is perhaps the most famous 
painting. I don't want to write too much about this, but what this is is August Goft again came and what he would do is he would take sketches of royal figures in his notebook, take them back, sketch as many as he could. And then from there, this was, so he, his, he visited in the 1840s, early 1840s. And as I said before, Maharaja Sher Singh was his main um, inspiration for payments. So he would commission a lot of the paintings August did, but he would sadly pass away before he could see masterpieces like this. This is one of the first drawings, uh, one of the main drawings that we have that actually labels a lot of influential figures in the Sikh Darbar. So on the white horse, being the main uh, center of the stage, you could say, is Maharaja Sher Singh. And all the attention, if you look, every, majority of the people are looking at him, probably because he did commission the painting, so he wanted to be the main focus. But what this is, is Sher Singh returning from a hunt. In the background, we see the umbrella. That just below that is Maharaja, uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So I'll just point it out here so it's easier to see here. And even he is looking down at Maharaja Sher Singh. In this, you could see also the foreign officers in the court of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Here you've got these, these people would be the ones that were sent out to the British to negotiate or in France, Hungary, because a lot of people tend to think that only Sikhs fought for the Sikh empire, but in reality, you had people from America, France, Hungary, um, middle of India, South India, Bengal. So it was, it was you could say, a United Nation, right? <laughs> a lot of people from all over the globe actually partook, and w which is what allowed the, um, the army to be as great as it was. You can, yeah, so you can also see how there's offerings of jewelry and stuff, that, which would all be donated to the Maharaja himself. So this building does still exist, and it is in Lahore, like a lot of our architecture, but it's lost its essence because the royalty isn't there anymore, so there's a lot that we've lost out on since the partition. But yeah, so that's the end of the presentation. Thank you guys for listening. The next steps, due to a lot of people being here, we're allowed to take 15 people at a time into, so once you leave the door on your left, and that's due to the art fragility and also spacing, so it works better for the safety. There are snacks in the main foyer, but you're not allowed to take them into the boardroom where the paintings are and in the auditorium here. I will have an art, um, art gallery, pretty much, presentation going on while people wait for their turn to go in. So if you want to stay seated in here or have your snacks, come back here and go turn by turn into the art. So, yeah. Thank you. But yeah, so if you guys want to head into the foyer, maybe grab some snacks and then... We'll see from there.